It is Friday, April 15th. Let's talk PlayStation. All right. Welcome back, everyone. It was another, I was going to say a slow news week, but that's not entirely true because there's still plenty of things going on. It's just that we're still waiting for, you know, a few big things like a, a possible PSVR 2 showcase or uh, another acquisition, which it seems like those can happen at any given moment. Um, and we kind of have a story about that or maybe a state of play. You know, these things are not happening right now, but they might soon. Um, but besides that, we do have other things uh, to go over. So first, as always, the PS Plus reminder. So. Uh, the April games, make sure you go ahead and claim those. They're they're live, they're available. Um, but for our first story, let's talk about PS4 system software update 9.51, where as expected, it's a small update. So nothing major here, just a slight improvement to the overall system performance. And the same goes for PS5's recent update. This one was 22.01.05.02. Uh, and the only change log item was a improvement to the overall system performance. Um, however, this is a good time to bring up this one thing that I keep forgetting to bring up and I apologize because I know a lot of you recently uh, reached out and asked about this, but I am aware that since that last major PS5 update, which was about, you know, what was that, four weeks ago, that one actually had one extra feature that we didn't know about until it went public and it started affecting people, which is that PS5 now supports auto low latency mode for new TVs that also support auto low latency mode, which sounds good in theory. That means you can get your response time down uh, as good as possible, more or less. Um, but you may be in a situation where you don't want to use that, right? And so you could turn it off, but the problem is you can't. So what PS5 does is it automatically changes your TV settings to the auto low latency mode, uh, which is a game mode preset on newer LG and Sony TVs. Um, Vincent Tio of HGTV Test recently did a video on this, a uh, really good video showcasing what this problem looks like and also some ways to troubleshoot it. But essentially what's happening is that your PS5 is automatically doing this and you can't um, turn it off, which means that certain settings on your TV are now, they're now grayed out, as in you can't turn off well, you can't adjust a number of things, right? You can't change your, your uh, picture presets. You can't adjust noise reduction or, you know, use black frame insertion. It's just, um, you know, something where if you don't, if you don't want to use auto low latency mode, then you, you kind of don't have a choice. Uh, so depending on the TV that you have, your options are fairly limited because not every TV allows you to turn this off. So it would be much better from the PS5 side of things if you could. Um, so unfortunately, uh, there's really not much that, that can be done right now. The only thing I would recommend if this is uh, happening to you is reach out to um, ask PlayStation on Twitter, um, hit up their customer support, send an email. I know that sounds like the worst advice whatsoever, but you know, telling them is how they find out about these things. And I would, I would gather that they do know about it. It's just that um, you really can't we can't do anything until they address it. Um, so I would just hope that with the uh, next update, which we assume is going to include a uh, variable refresh rate. So that might be the one where this is also included, where on PS5, you can at least in the settings, turn it off. That would be ideal. So at least it's not dependent on the TV. It would be dependent on PlayStation 5. Moving on to our next story, following an investigation by the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK, it looks like Sony is now going to be a bit more compliant in how they handle um, PlayStation Plus subscriptions, or more importantly for long-term subscribers that may not necessarily use the service anymore. This has always been a problem with uh, you know subscriptions in general where sometimes you subscribe, let's say you stop using it, you forget, the auto renewal kicks in and sure enough you're charged another you know 50 pounds when you don't want to use it anymore and then you go and cancel oh there's no way to cancel you can't get a refund sometimes even turning off auto renewal in general is a pain so what they're now going to do or what sony's now going to do to be more compliant is that if you are a long-term subscriber of ps plus and you're not actively using it so let's say you're not playing online you're not claiming the monthly games Sony will then send you an email saying, hey, um, here's how to cancel. If you don't cancel and you're still not using PS Plus, then they will stop taking payments. Uh, Nintendo is also uh, changing as well, where for NSO, you're not going to, well, the default option will no longer be auto renewal being set to on, so you'll have to turn that on manually if you want to actually use that. But otherwise, uh, this is good news, of course. It's something where uh, it sucks when we have to get to this point where, you know, some sort of agency has to step in and say, you're not doing enough to, you know, protect the, the consumer's bottom line, which... <laughs> Of course, Sony's not really going to do willingly, or at least most companies don't, but um, more consumer transparency is always 
is always the best policy going forward. So at the very least, uh, this is a nice change that is uh, certainly welcomed. Now, while we're talking about PlayStation Plus, this is a good segue to our next story, which is about the Oddworld creator, Lauren Lanning, where recently he was on the Xbox Expansion Pass podcast talking about, uh, well, a number of things, but he was also asked directly about, you know, PS Plus and subscription services, you know, how does he feel? And we know that for Oddworld Soulstorm, that game was on PS Plus back in April 2021. And one quote that came out of this interview that was uh, published across a few websites was that for Oddworld Soulstorm on PS Plus, that deal was, quote, devastating, which depending on, you know, if you saw this already and, and if you read the articles, it's not like they did a bad job explaining this, but um, the context is really missing when it's it's so important when we have it on video or let's say it's a podcast, always best to, if you really want to know, watch the whole thing or listen to the whole thing, the whole quote rather, just so you get an idea of what the context was. Because right now, of course, one of the hottest topics when it comes to subscription services, whether, whether that's PS plus or game pass it's always a matter of you know but is this good for the industry is this good for developers and we often hear really good stories but sometimes we get not good stories and maybe this sounds like one of them but i'm not sure that's entirely the case based on the context so here's what he was actually explaining Lauren was pretty candid about how for Oddworld Soulstorm, that game was not going to get made without this uh, particular deal, or at least he was putting it out there that at the time, you know, they're independent, they uh, have a lot of debt, they got a lot of people to pay. And so it seemed like at the time, the deal that they were presented where Sony said, hey, we'll cut you, you know, a check. And we, we assume that most PS Plus deals are a fixed amount, but they were presented a number that worked for them. And they thought, hey, this is more than we're going to make when we launched this game in January, 2021, which was the original target. They expected to sell anywhere from 50 to 100,000 copies, but more realistically, probably 50,000, which, um, you know, that was a, a number that the PS Plus money was gonna be higher. So they took the deal. What we didn't see coming is that COVID hit, um, and that's where they had to delay the game. Most developers had to delay their games at that time. And so the now the game launched in April. And between that time, this was where it was only a PS5 benefit. So their check that they were given, I would assume, was, is largely based on how many PS5 consoles were out there, right? So by the time the game actually launched um, on PS Plus, it was downloaded 4 million times. And this is where Lauren Lanning says it was devastating because it's something where if they had launched earlier, it would have financially made more sense. I, I think the point he's, he's really trying to get across is that it was more of a have your cake and eat it too kind of thing where they could have either you know, launched on time and the deal would have just made sense or they could have waited a bit, which I'm not sure that was even really an option, but you know, if there's more PS5 consoles out there, then in theory you should be, you should be getting offered a larger check based on how many times Sony thinks your game's going to get downloaded. Um, so there's more leverage when it comes to those conversations between the developer and Sony. Um, so they, they might've been able to either earn more from PS Plus or not launch on PS Plus and just sell more than 50 to 100,000 copies or sell more than the original PS Plus deal. I don't think what he's getting at here is that we would have sold 4 million copies that would be rather foolish to think, and I'm I'm certain that's not what he's getting at. Just that because it was exposed to so many people, they really did miss out on probably a, a better situation. But he does outline again that it was you know more of a COVID thing that nobody really saw coming. Nobody's at fault, and that's more or less what he was getting at. So at least when it comes to the conversation of are these subscription models and games good for developers, I'm not really sure this one necessarily applies to that uh, conversation, or at least not in the way that we think it would. Next up, uh, recently there was a very weird problem going on when trying to play certain digital games on PS3 and Vita where you would try and start it and it wouldn't work because it now has a brand new expiration date of 1969 and that doesn't make much sense. Uh, so what's going on here? It seems like initial reports came out. Well, the problem seems to go back at least a week and a half, two weeks, but um, it's something where this wasn't really widespread or widely known until Kotaku and The Verge posted some articles and discovered that there were various posts and problems across you know, Reddit, GameFAQs, uh, Twitter. Um, one Twitter user, Christopher, posted a pretty long thread showcasing that his initial problem started with uh, Chrono Cross, which, you know, that initially led people to think that, okay, is this Square Enix trying to push people into buying their, you know, not so good remaster? Uh, but no, it wasn't just that. It was a, a number of PS1 classics and also regular PSN games where, for whatever reason, their um, expiration dates were updated to showcase uh, 1969. 
And so no matter what, whether you re-download a game, try and restore licenses, it wasn't working. That was uh, like four or five days ago where a lot of that went down and well, two days ago, now it's fixed. Uh, which, okay, what, what happened here? Uh, this is in all likelihood related to some sort of Unix Epoch issue, which the Unix Epoch is an arbitrary date and time that is set uh, on the back end of you know operating systems where it's just a starting point to start counting time for a unit of measurement and across various operating systems. That could be 1969, it could be 1970, um, which seems to be the most common. I know some systems do use like 1950 and some might use like, 1600 i i can't remember exactly but it's something where that's that's what it is and it seems like something went wrong on sony's back end where certain games were defaulting to that unix epoch time which would make it impossible to start your games but um now it's fixed and it's something where you don't have to re-download just log back into psn and your license will be updated because you you own it so it'll more or less remove the uh the expiration date entirely um yeah a little weird but good to see that they fixed it this soon because uh the reports were again a week and a half two weeks ago once it was widely reported then we saw it get fixed pretty soon. And it's always a little bit alarming when we have an issue with PS3 and Vita. We know they're not really high priority being legacy platforms. So it's actually great to see that they were really on top of this and got it sorted uh, very quickly. Moving on to our next news story, Sony made another investment in Epic Games, uh, this time $1 billion. Uh, so in total, they're up to $1.45 billion, where back in, what was it, mid-2020, they did $250 million, and then a year later, another $200 million, and now another billion, so $1.45 total. Uh, this was part of a recent uh, $2 billion funding series, so it was a billion each between the Sony Group and also the holding company behind the Lego Group, actually. So, yeah, $2 billion total, but $1 billion from Sony. Over on Epic Games' uh, website, uh, during the press release, the Sony Corporation uh, CEO, Kenichiro Yoshida, said, and I quote here, As a creative entertainment company, we are thrilled to invest in Epic Games to deepen our relationship in the metaverse field, a space where creators and users share their time. We are also confident that Epic's expertise, including their powerful game engine, combined with Sony's technologies, will accelerate our various efforts such as the development of new digital fan experiences in sports and our virtual production initiatives. Uh, so, I guess this isn't really all that surprising when we see that we already have two investments so far, and sure, this one's a billion dollars, it's a lot bigger, but we can see two years of continued investments where... Well, now they're only getting bigger, right? So they're up to 1.45 total. And um, the best way to look at this is holistically. So sure, this does obviously benefit PlayStation in the long term. And it really is probably in Sony's best interest to uh, get very close to a publishing partner as big as Epic. But it's something where um, this benefits the Sony group in total, right? That's why they, they keep doing these larger investments. And now they're doing a billion dollars. You know, I'm seeing a lot of folks say that like, okay, a billion dollars and you're only investing in Epic, like what's going on? Why are you doing this? Why aren't you acquiring more studios or doing this, this and that? Here's how the money should be spent. But um, it is something where Kenichiro Yoshida laid it out pretty obviously. It's uh, for a number of initiatives, right? Not just PlayStation, but things like virtual experiences, uh, sporting events, and also, yes, that uh, that dirty word, the the metaverse, which I am so sick of hearing, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are. It's just because we're hearing it so much, and it's like, like, come on, like we're so far away from some sort of metaverse really catching on and being mainstream. But unfortunately, when it comes to you know new and emerging technologies and experimental technologies, where they have the you know, it's high risk, high reward. I mean, they're going to be working on it and they're going to be experimenting and trying to strategically align themselves with other companies that have, you know, that have mutual interests. It's, uh, you know, Sony, the Sony group is obviously going to be looking at this stuff, um, much like any other company. So it's, uh, kind of weird to hear so soon, but it's not like this was like, it's not like this was a bad investment. Epic's uh, rising in value every single year and um, it does benefit PlayStation in, in the long run. We'll see if they make another investment uh, by the same time next year. Anyway, moving on to our next story, as part of an interview with GQ Magazine, Pedro Pascal, who we know is playing as Joel in the Last of Us HBO TV series, uh, was recently asked about the show, the game, has he played the game, 
he said he did, or at least he tried to play the game, uh, and I assume the first game, right, where he uh, didn't really do that well. He had to hand the controller to his nephew where he tried to watch as long as he could, um, so he probably didn't play the entire, or he didn't see the whole game, rather, but he did mention that he wants to try and, it's a weird balancing act of trying to honor the character and being appreciative, but also keeping a healthy distance away to not mimic them too much. And then he also mentions how for, well, the show in particular and how filming is going, he delivers a very interesting quote here where he says, they're doing some really smart things is all I can say. It's similar to the way Jon Favreau and Dave Filoni treat The Mandalorian and how Mason and Druckmann are treating The Last of Us. It's in good hands because they love it so much. Uh, you know, and I, I believe that, um, not so much that it's a direct comparable to say how The Mandalorian was filmed, but rather, I can see that they're at least uh, really trying to put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into making this thing really work. And at least for, well, the context of like what's going on in this situation, right? Like most games get converted to, to movies, or at least if they're going to get adapted to something, you know, they like to go to movies and movies are really weird because a lot of games are longer than two hours. And so you've got to convert this 10 or 30 hour experience into a, um, you know, into a condensed hour and a half, two hour thing. And there's already challenges in place of trying to stay true to the source material and having a budget where it makes sense. And, you know, the Uncharted movie was actually pretty good. Um, but at least going from a, you know, what is, uh, Last of Us is like, what, you can spend easily 18, 20 hours playing the main story, if I remember correctly. It's been a while since I played the original game, but, um, you know, you've got a long-form game that can be translated to a long-form TV show where you've got hours to work with and tell sort of the same story beats, but fit in other things along the way, and it, I'm just, I don't know, I'm feeling very positive about it. Um, Maybe it's because with PS Productions, they did show that, uh, at least with Uncharted, it was, in fact, serviceable. Like, definitely good, not mind-blowing, but um, between that and, say, the Ghost of Tsushima movie, which we'll talk about in a second here, it, um, yeah, I, I can see the comparable being drawn of, like, hey, they're, they're definitely trying to put the same love and energy into it as, say, The Mandalorian, which was received quite well. Uh, but anyway, going back to the Ghost of Tsushima movie, this is where we now have, uh, or we now know who's writing the screenplay. Uh, as reported by Deadline, it's Takashi uh, Dosher, and he recently wrote and directed Only and Still, which those are, that's what they're called. I haven't seen them, but um, that's what he did previously, and he's doing the screenplay for this. Uh, but the director is still Chad Stahelski, and that's really the only update we have here. This is still going to be very far away, I presume, assuming that, because um, you know, movies, again, they seem to take a long time if they do get hung up in one key aspect, like the screenplay, or if it needs a revision, or, you know, if they can't secure talent. It's uh, something where even when we're given a tentative, you know, release year, it still gets pushed back year after year after year. Um, if they get everything all lined up, they can do the thing in, in one year if everything all falls into place, but that seems to never really be a guarantee when it comes to movies. But I'm still fairly positive on this movie. It's something where it could be so well done with every moving piece doing exactly what it should and being authentic, but uh, there's a certain level here or there's a certain part of it where I'm like, they're going to do something wrong. And not just like a little wrong, but like really wrong. And I'm nervous, but I would still love to see them really knock it out of the park because uh, Ghost of Tsushima, that story, I loved it. And it really hit so well for me. But I mean, you have to really sell it like the game did and be authentic and true, which uh, that's where I'm just a bit nervous. It seems like, you know, it's their ball to drop on this one where if they can't get this right, I mean, it was kind of just sitting there waiting to be um, capitalized on and that's where I'm just not so sure, but we'll see. Now, the really big talking point this past week was the speculation that perhaps Kojima Productions will be acquired by PlayStation. Uh, and this was sparked by the revelation that on PlayStation's main site uh, for their the webpage for PlayStation Studios that was recently updated with that you know banner in the background spanning across all those IP that are representing PlayStation uh, Studios, uh, first party studios, mind you, because there is a difference nowadays when we say PlayStation Studios, that does mean uh, first and second party games. They changed that terminology and put that branding out there when they launched PS5. Otherwise, you know, before then we would have said Worldwide Studios and that would have strictly meant first party studios. But it is important to make that distinction nowadays that a PlayStation Studio game doesn't necessarily mean it's from a first party developer. It could be XDev. 
with that said, this banner was updated to reflect uh, a number of you know changes like uh, Horizon was changed to the updated graphic for Forbidden West. Also, uh, Shohei Otani was added for MLB. And then Concrete Genie, which would represent Pixel Opus, they were removed entirely for uh, Death Stranding to represent Kojima Productions, which meant, or that led some people to speculate that have they acquired uh, Kojima Productions and is this some sort of weird slip up or is this how they're putting it out there like we saw for Blue Point where that was a that was clearly a mistake and took a while to see confirmation of that but you know what's going on here are they representing are they representing you know a second party game are they were they acquired you know why Death Stranding why not other second party games or other PlayStation IP right there's so many uh, situations and that's where people are talking back and forth about what this means and in the grand scheme of things Kojima recently confirmed the studio is not being acquired he says and I quote here I'm sorry for the misunderstanding but Kojima Productions has been and will continue to be an independent studio. Now before that tweet um, Games Beat reporter Jeff Grubb uh, talked on his recent live stream about how for well one for the acquisition that we talked about three weeks ago or something the big acquisition that was between Jeff and Greg Miller where they couldn't verify it and they didn't really even want to say what it was or at least what they're hearing uh, apparently Kojima Productions was not that name. It would have been larger, but more so he also uh, referenced the Xbox project again that he's been reporting on where he says he still is hearing that it's it's ongoing, that it's not, you know, gone or anything like that or, or, or that it's canceled. Um, the last update was from last year where he mentioned that Kojima and Xbox, both they both signed a letter of intent. And mind you, that's not a binding agreement. In most circumstances, it certainly could be if there's a stipulation in there, but for the most part, a letter of intent does not necessarily guarantee that he has to make that Xbox game or that, um, you know, that would prevent an acquisition or, or what have you. But that's besides the point, especially because, again, it seems like a lot of people are really giving Jeff Grubb a ton of grief for that rumor. Please lay off the guy. Um, I don't know why. It's... If you don't like his track record, I don't know how. Um, remember, he's not an insider. He's a reporter. He, I mean, that's his living. He is networking. He's reaching out to people. He's asking questions. He's trying to verify from two or three different sources. He's not some random Twitter account insider. He's a reporter. So I don't know why people seem to give him so much grief. He certainly reported on things incorrectly, but we need to like look at his track record and see that he's verifiably done. He's gotten so many things correct. And most recently, wasn't he the first one to put out the PS Plus tier names? So just let it go with the whole Xbox Kojima game thing. Um, seems like that's still possibly happening, but either, either way, that still would not have prevented either an acquisition or a PlayStation game in general. Uh, what we can say confidently right now, though, is that there is no acquisition happening right now. And I will humor the idea slightly that obviously they're going to deny it currently if they are, say, in talks of being acquired or something, but... It seems like that's not happening. I mean, for Kojima, he's always wanted to be independent after the whole Konami thing, and I don't blame him. Of course, things do change. We see a lot of developers over the years say they want to remain independent, but you know, nowadays that's becoming increasingly more difficult as they uh, go back to publishers, uh, look for funding, and also look to be acquired if the you know if the numbers make sense. And that could certainly happen for Kojima, but it seems like right now that does not seem to be the case um but i will say that if it did happen wouldn't really surprise me it's something where the formula it does fit quite well there i mean sony funded that studio from the ground up and uh it seems like the relationship there between the two is still very good uh kojima wants to you know do tv and film and sony has the resources for that i mean in theory it it adds up um so if it happened tomorrow if it happened a year from now if, if it happened five years from now it would be kind of like a, oh, yeah, okay, well, that really made a lot of sense uh, for both parties involved. But it um, doesn't seem like that's happening currently. And um, we still got some waiting to do for that next acquisition because Sony's going to be doing more. But at least for the time being, we can somewhat safely say it's not going to be uh, Kojima Productions. Now, with all that said, it is time for Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. And if you'd like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. Follow the link down below. Supporting this channel, a number of ways can gain you an entry. And I'll announce the winner next week because I'm trying to help pay for your games.
those are all the stories that I wanted to talk about you all from this past week. And our Tuesday video was kind of a more of an opinion piece on why I'm liking PS5 a lot more than PS4 so far when launch aligned at least, um, which nowadays it seems like Sony has a lot more scrutiny on them and rightfully so. But even despite that, uh, PS5 is doing a lot of things really well right now compared to PS4. And so go check out some of the points made in that video and uh, coming up as always something on Tuesday and hopefully um, some major PlayStation news because uh, Sony really likes Tuesdays for, you know, big announcements and press releases. So uh, fingers crossed, we'll see if something cool happens. But until then, that's it. That concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Panecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me and I will see you all next Friday.